Kia ora koutou, welcome to Face to Face and our new studio, check it out. Can you not hear the echo, echo, echo? Isn't it wonderful? And uh, debuting in our Flash New Digs uh, is the wonderful Bernard Hickey. Kia ora Bernard. G'day. So uh, here we're, we're talking today about interest rates, uh, how they are at global lows right around the world uh, and what's caused that massive change in the availability of cheap money. So Bernard, massive changes in recent years, what are some of the factors that have led to low interest rates? It is amazing, isn't it? Interest it rates at pretty much zero in most parts of the developed world. And even in New Zealand, 2.25% the official cash rate, it's our record low. Uh, and the big issue over the last seven or eight years has been slower economic growth than everyone thought, but also much lower inflation combination of factors. You've got globalization, which means we can buy cheap stuff from just about anywhere, and not just stuff, but also services, particularly with the changes in technology. You can get so much stuff for free online now. And secondly, you've got an aging population, particularly in the developed world. And as more people get closer to retirement, they tend to spend less of their income. They tend to save more. And they're in a sort of what I call a boring time. You know, once you get after the age of 50, you stop trying to impress people. You stop trying to spend money uh, hand over fist. You, you know, you don't have to buy new curtains or kit out the house to uh, look after the kids. So you start to save more money. And when everyone does that at the same time, it tends to slow down the circulation, slow down the pressure that's on the economy in terms of uh, competition to buy things. So inflation has been quite a bit lower than everyone thought. And, and that ageing population thing is, is really striking because as interest rates have dropped, we've actually seen people save more. Yeah, this is a great paradox here where interest rates go lower and people think, oh, gee, that means I'm going to have to save even more in my retirement. So they pump even more in, which is completely against what you'd think. Because normally when interest rates go lower and you're a saver, that's supposed to encourage you to spend. But the irony here is that a lot of older people in developed countries, potentially because of the global financial crisis, they're a bit more nervous anyway, are all going, gee, if interest rates are only half a percent, that means I have to save twice as much. And so they spend even less. And it becomes this sort of doom spiral. You get interest rates lower. And instead of stimulating activity, it actually depresses activity. And that's one of the concerns here. So a combination of the global financial crisis shock, aging populations, technology, globalization has meant we've got very low inflation. And because central banks now are forced, in a way, to target inflation, they're almost like some sort of uh, doomsday machine. They have to cut interest rates even lower to get uh, uh, inflation back up again. And, and it's a bit like flogging a dead horse. They keep trying to get it down. It's just not getting, just not uh, pushing up inflation. And so that's one of the problems here. In New Zealand, although we're a bit further behind the curve than a lot of others, uh, certainly we've got the same issues. And uh, the irony is, of course, we invented inflation targeting. Yeah, way oh, right back, the, Re the Reserve Bank Act is all our great idea. Right? <laughs> That's right, and we've exported this great doomsday machine, which is uh, you've got to target inflation, and you can only do that with one tool, which is your official cash rate or your official interest rates. And so everyone's done it, and you've seen it in Europe, uh, the United States, and the UK. They've got uh, very low inflation, and in their cases, they've cut interest rates to zero. Uh, or even lower. In fact, in continental Europe uh, and in Japan, you've got uh, official rates which are below zero. Incredible. And now yeah. you've got uh, um, government bond yields in these countries, particularly Japan, Europe, and even now in the UK after Brexit, you've got over $11 trillion worth of government bonds that are now trading with negative yields. That means you are giving your money to a government and you're paying the government to look after the money. It's quite extraordinary. So not only are you losing inflation, which admittedly isn't much, uh, but you're also you're, you're actually even in, on a nominal basis, you're losing money. That's right. You're essentially either saying, "I'm so scared, I'm desperate for a safe investment that I'm sure to get my money back, or at least most of my money back at the end of it," or you're making a bet that there's actually going to be quite a lot of deflation, and you're actually getting a real return because your negative yield is not quite as negative as the deflation. So that's the, the sort of uh, real problem here, is that so many people are nervous about the future, mm -hmm. worried about deflation, that they're happy to accept a negative yield on a government bond. And who's got all this money? Who's putting money into 
negative y yielding bonds? I mean, wh where's, where's all this cash coming from? Well, essentially it's old savers in places like Germany and Japan, and to an extent the United States, the United Kingdom, most of the developed world. Because uh, the um, way that we invest tends to change as we get older. The closer we get to retirement, the, 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 less, the less risk mm. we want to take mm. on. We, mm. we, we keep thinking, gee, if I retire next year and there's some sort of market meltdown two months before I retire, I'm not going to have much money left over. So what people tend to do is go for less volatile investments that they might have less return in the longer run, but in the short run, you, you're going to know you're going to lose a bit less. So that's the uh, the problem here is that as more people get close to retirement, they tend to pump more money into these low risk assets. And what about China? How much money is coming? You know, people talk about money coming out of China. Is, is, is that contributing to it as well? Or is that Part of the reason in China is that a lot of people save a lot of money. Uh, about 50% is the household savings rate. It's amazing. If you think in New Zealand... Don't try that at home. Well, maybe right. you <laughs> <laughs> and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, firstly, uh, there isn't much of a social safety net in, in China. Uh, so uh, there's not much of a retirement benefit. Uh, the health system isn't very good. And also education is not nearly as developed or, or paid for by the state. So a lot of households in China tend to save a lot of money to make sure that they've got something to look to look after them and their family in retirement, either for health costs or saving for education costs. So that's um, part of the reason they're a very high saving economy. Uh, they have a lot of capital controls, so they're not sort of exporting too much of it. Although the bit that squirts out the edges tends to go into assets like property in you know, North America, uh, the UK and in places like Australia and New Zealand as those savers look to diversify their assets. They're, try they're trying to look for safe places to put their money. And uh, just like everyone else, they're looking for places to avoid the risk that, uh, you know, if one asset or one thing collapses, they'll get wiped out completely. So that brings us to the, to the impacts of this global low interest rate environment, which is tons of cheap money to invest. And where's that going? It's going into existing assets, particularly so property. Right, so what we're seeing here is actually happening all the way around the world. That's right. I mean, people are able to go to their bank and borrow at a very low interest rate and then plonk it all into an existing house. Or uh, if they've got lots of cash, uh, we're certainly seeing in the UK, uh, Europe, Japan, and in the United States, people putting money into things like art. You know, so they can store a lot of money into a very small place. Diamonds, for example, some of the prices for record diamonds are incredibly high. The trouble is that money is not being invested in what I call real assets. Now, those are the ones that actually create jobs, that make us richer in the long run, that improve our ability to be more productive. So these are things like infrastructure. Um, America, for example, has got trillions of dollars worth of uh, um, work that needs to be done on bridges and roads and not to mention on people's education and health. But that's just not being invested because for whatever reasons governments aren't investing in infrastructure. And also a lot of companies who should be investing in new products and new factories and, and new ways to be more productive are quite nervous, partly after the global financial crisis but also because of this these big waves of technology change that are happening. If you're a, you an know, executive at GE or Toyota, you might be worried that, let's say I build a new type of car or a, a new type of washing machine. How do I know that in the next six months, some, some Uber clone isn't gonna- It's gonna leapfrog you. Exactly, yeah. invent a new app or something and suddenly all those thousands of people who are gonna build this thing, they're out of work. I mean, just look at Kodak, they had 20,000 employees and within a decade, uh, you know, Instagram and mobile phones and those sorts of things had wiped them out. So that's, uh, we've got this, sort of horrible situation where interest rates are very low and they should be stimulating economies, but bizarrely they're not for all these reasons. And that creates the, the problem of how do central banks react? At the moment they seem to be locked into this drive to try and get inflation back up again by cutting interest rates, which just makes it even worse. And uh, governments seem not very able to sort of break the logjam by doing some proper investment. Right. So. That's a, a, you know, a great overview of the, the problem that we currently see now. In the next video, we're going to look at what are some of the things that reserve banks can do differently to try to hold back this incredible bubble that's, uh, that's appearing in the asset markets.